Okay. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm the Education Coordinator at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center and National Landmark in East Hampton. And today we have our virtual tour of our temporary exhibition called Portrait in Green by Lee Krasner. The exhibition was curated by our director, Helen Harrison. And um, what I'm gonna do today is uh, first I'm going to show you some of the images in the exhibition on a PowerPoint so you can really get a, a good look at them and then I will tour you around the exhibition and the house and then we will go into the barn studio where Lee created her famous portrait in green and I'm going to give you an overview of um, the history of Lee and the house as I said, we are a national landmark. We are the home of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. They settled here in 1945 in East Hampton in an area called the Springs. And um, we're located about 100 miles east of New York City. Um, Pollock and uh, Krasner were living in New York City. They moved out here in 1945, bought the property in 1946, and um, they created a groundbreaking art called Abstract Expressionism. Now, as you could see, Pollock here is doing his drip painting technique, where he lays the canvas on the floor, works from all four sides, and drips paint from sticks to make 100% abstract art. It's a very physical way of painting. You might say it's a release of energy. And you'll notice Pollock is using his entire body. He's walking around the canvas. Sometimes he steps into the canvas. And let me just let, oh, good. Okay, and um, he's called an action painter because he's using his entire body. But not only that, his action is evident in the final work. Lee Krasner is pictured in the photo behind him. Lee, of course, managed Pollock's career. He catapults to fame. She did not promote herself as an, you know, professionally or very little while he was alive. And, um, but she always continued to paint throughout the marriage and of course beyond. She's a very important painter and figure in the formation of abstract expressionism. And Lee is also an action painter. And today we're gonna to focus on one of her uh, most important works called Portrait in Green, which was made in 1969. And we will also look at um, the other works that she made just only in that one year. Now in the exhibition, which I'll show you in a moment, we have these photographs by Mark Pat Patiki, and um, these are the only photographs of Lee painting. There are other photographs of her doing collages and there's a video of her doing a collage, but this is the only set of photos which shows her at work doing her action painting in the barn studio. Now, uh, well, just a little bit behind the story of how Mark came to photograph Lee. He actually came out here in 1969 to, he was a fashion photographer and he was asked to do a portrait of Lee, a formal portrait. And while he was out here, um, she was painting in the studio and um, he asked if he could take pictures of her and she agreed, which was very, very unique. Now, what do you notice? I'm gonna throw out a question. What do you notice about her process of painting here? How would you describe her process? Anyone? What did he capture here? Who would like to unmute? I'll, I'll unmute. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. She's moving and she's in action as she's whirling around in big and big movements. Yes, very good, very good. And that's exactly what the photographer said. And I'll read his account of this, um, this process of photographing. I realized that I needed to find a unique way to take these pictures. I felt that the best way to do that was to have some blurred motion because she was so extraordinarily energetic. 
She imbued her painting with energy and she exhibited that energy as she confronted the canvas. So I began taking photos and I realized that, that if I could do a series of her, I would be able to capture the motion with a series of stills. And that's exactly what transpired. We spent about an hour or so as she worked and each time she would race to the canvas with her brush and make large strokes and then stand back and contemplate what she had done. I watched her all of this time and then she stood back and said, it's finished. I blurted out, how can you tell? And she said, I know. Indeed, she was very comfortable with the fact that she knew exactly what she wanted to do and she knew exactly when she was finished doing it. And that of course is according to the photographer, Mark Patiki. And here is the final uh, portrait in green, which is quite large. And I'll, I'll show you in a moment. Have some fun looking at this picture. What do you see when you look at this picture? Anything stand out? There's no right or wrong answers. Who would like to unmute and tell us? It's full of life. It's full of life, Joyce. What makes you say that? Well, the green reminds me like it's nature and it's exuberant. Like it just, yeah, it's fun. It's, <laughs> it's exuberant. It's fun. It's full of life. And you know what? I love Lee Krasner's work because in my opinion, I see how she went through the bereavement process, losing Pollock at, he was 44 in the dr drunk driving accident in 1956. Three years later, she lost her mother. She did a series um, after the loss of her mother of umber paintings because she had insomnia. She would go into the studio and, and paint at night. And to me, the paintings really speak about grief. And then we see this exuberant color and life come forward in her action paintings. And Lee was influenced by Matisse who use very, very bright colors, often even complementary colors. And like Matisse, sometimes she would pare down the color in her paintings to one or two colors, often even using red and green, which are complementary colors. So there we see the influence of Matisse. Also, Joyce, you say exuberant. You can see the movement. It's a, almost like a rhythmic dance, isn't it, right? And she doesn't have a plan when she starts out. Pataki says in his quote, she knew exactly what she wanted to do, but it's not the sort of knowing where uh, you have a plan in mind and you follow that plan or you follow that sketch. In fact, Lee was very clear about in interviews that she surrenders to the painting process. She doesn't will the painting. She, you could say you go with the flow, but that's not to say that it's like chaos. She's really one with the moment in painting in the process. One mark leads to the other. So Lee says about her colors and her process, let us assume I want to paint a blue picture, but instead the picture comes out of linzerin or yellow. This is the aspect of painting which interests me the most, the mystery of painting, which I try to stay with, is the alinzerin which comes out, right? In other words, she's willing to shift during the process. She doesn't have to uh, be faithful to her original idea. This takes courage, right? Because you really have to trust the process. Does anybody have any other comments about what you see in the painting or Lee's process or any questions? Anyone else? I see that aside from the massive green strokes, there are many small, very precisely drawn, and they look like they're either black or maybe dark green that are interspersed between them. And I'm not sure what they are. I might see an eye. I could see something that looked like a clock. So it, there's basically two different components to the painting that I see. Yeah, very good observation. Thank you for that. 
And we're going to see in her works on paper, which were done in an entirely different way, there is this element of a heavier mark or a more precise mark and a more fluid mark. So it's actually a good comparison to this painting where you do see some of the green is translucent and some of it is heavier and linear. Good point. Um, Anybody see anything else? Could I say something, please? Sure, yes, please. Um, I thought it kind of looked like graffiti. With, for me, it looked like bubble letters, like graffiti almost. So that's immediately mm -hmm. what I saw when I was trying to figure out what the words were. I thought she was writing a word for some reason. And I was trying to figure out what she was saying, but she probably wasn't, but it looks like that to me. Yeah, that's a very good comparison as well. In Pollock's work as well, sometimes it's almost like a calligraphy and you wonder, are there letters in there? But it is a mystery because you can't really pin it down and say, oh yes, that is definitely the letter L or that is definitely that she's spelling out a word. But yes, absolutely, it could remind you of... Um, lettering or even graffiti. Anyone else? And that's a really good comparison actually. Because if you imagine the graffiti artists, right? They're also using their entire body, right? So let's hear a little about Lee, from Lee about her working method. She says, I make the first gesture, then other gestures occur, then observation. Something in the abstract movement suggests a form. I'm often astonished at what I'm confronted with when the major part comes through. Then I just go along with it. It's either organic in content or quite abstract, but there's no forced decision. I want to get myself something in the act of painting. I sustain my interest in it through spontaneity. And I love what she says here, she makes the gesture, the movement, and then she observes. So as I said, this is not a random act of painting because she's using careful observation, right? And I like the way she says, I'm often astonished at what I'm confronted with. There's an element of surprise when you're an artist, isn't there? Where you're like, whoa, where did that come from? I didn't even know I was gonna make that. That's why when people say, well, when you're interpreting art and someone might say, well, what did the artist mean? Sometimes the artist doesn't exactly know what he, she, or they mean, right? It, as Lee says, it's a mystery. There's a mystery to painting. Any questions, ideas? Anyone wanna add anything? Now, 1969, this was the only canvas painting that Lee made. So in the exhibition, we have a series of works on paper, some selections that she made in 1969. They, these paintings are gouache on handmade paper created by Douglas Morse Howell. Gouache is a water-based paint. And um, this is handmade paper that um, was made by, as I said, Howell. And I'm just gonna read you a little bit about how the paper was made, okay? Um, hold on a minute. Powell said, my paper is made of fine damask tablecloths, no glue, sizing, or chemicals, and made by my own equipment designed and built from the ground up. And then uh, Helen says, he also used dish towels, napkins, and other linens with dyed elements resulting in colored pulp. The air dried sheets are notable for their irregular edges, toothy texture, and blotting paper porosity. Pollock visited Howell's workshop and bought $20 worth of papers, both plain and colored, and made a series of ink drawings on them. Now, Lee apparently uh, borrowed or took some of um, these drawings that Pollock had made on the papers and in 1954, and she recycled the these drawings to make collages. Um, but then later on in these works, she used the Howell papers. Some of them maybe were left over from Pollock and some of them maybe she purchased later. And she made this extensive series and uh, what she would do is she would float them in the bathtub to enhance the paper's absorbency, 
creating translucent areas with contrast. Um, and she would compliment, as someone said in the last painting, similarly, there's dense gestural elements with translucent elements when the gouache spread on the paper as it was soaking. I didn't put the titles in because I want you to interpret these. When you look at this beautiful work, what do you see? What does it remind you of? Anyone? Um, it kind of looks like a field, like an aerial view of, from a plane or something. Very interesting. You I know, see, when, like, yeah, well, wait, wait, one second, one second on the aerial view aspect. When you have an aerial view, what happens is the space sort of flattens out visually. When you're up in a plane or a high building and you look down, let's say if it's a field, it appears as flat shapes like rectangles. Mm. And in these paintings, and also in Portrait in a Green, the visual space becomes shallow. When you're standing on the ground and you're looking at the world, you're seeing depth. When you have an aerial view, for example, and you look down, you don't see depth, you see flat shapes. So similarly in Lee's canvases here, the space, the illusion of space is flattened. It becomes more shallow. It's a, not a deep space that's being created in these paintings. And that in part makes them more abstract. Now, anyone else see anything uh, different when you look? Go ahead, Bernice. Well, a garden and the green, you know, is like growth, like chlorophyll growth. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to me, mm -hmm. garden like. Yeah. And Diane, do you want to say anything about this one? Yes. And my last name is Scully. Scully. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, no relationship to Sean. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to say, to me, it looks like you are um, almost surrounded by your garden, like you're in it uh, because of the use of the lines, the color, um, the repetition of the forms. And it's like you are close up um, to, your, to your garden. Um, I quite like yeah. it. Very good point because you don't see the edges. Right. This is an all over pattern, right? It goes right off the edges of the rectangle. That's what so, I was going to, sorry. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to raise my hand on this thing, but go ahead. I used to be a textile designer. So it reminds me of textiles. In what way? In the fact that it runs off the edge of the page and um, it's really like an overall pattern. It doesn't really have depth to me. To me, it yeah. has like an overall pattern pattern kind of feeling like it's a chunk of a larger textile mm -hmm. yeah um it's actually called all over painting as well that's another <laughs> type of painting right and it's so interesting when we talk about space or viewpoint in a painting one person says this is like an aerial view as if we're looking down at something someone else says it's like a garden which would be frontal right growing up and down so sometimes our view, um, our perception of a view can shift when we're looking at abstract art, but it certainly calls attention also to the flatness of the canvas, the rectangle. So it's actually called Earth Number One. And this was part of a series that she did of earth paintings at that time in 1969. Now, how about this one? What do you make of this one? Do you see any themes here or any other images? The depth of the sea. <laughs> the depth of like the sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks all the turbulence and the bubbles and it's awesome. Yes, and it's called water number 14, right? And I love this one. It appears that she must have taken some kind of circular object and stamped it to get those circular patterns. And it's so beautiful. It's somewhat symmetrical, right? With this axis, this vertical axis in the center. And then this is a very good example. You see how the positive space would be the blues and the blacks, but then the white spaces in between 
are equally as important. They start to come forward. They're equally as beautiful, right? Anyone else want to comment on this one? To me, it almost reminds me of Art Deco with the straight line in the center and then the swirls coming out from the center to the sides. Mm -hmm. And Art Deco was inspired by nature, right? Right. Uh, and it uses, Art Deco uses a lot of arabesques, doesn't it? And in Lee's paintings, we see a lot of arabesques, like curves moving against curves. Anyone else? It kind of reminds, it makes me think of a farce and then first, and then I thought of that photo of um, Jackson Pollock's accident in the woods. Um, mm -hmm. so kind of like the round shapes could be almost like things flying and the wheels going around. I, mm -hmm. I know that's a big leap, but it kind of made me think of that. Well, yeah, it's interesting because there's such a beauty to it, but then that darkness also, it could be almost a little violent, right? You could look at it in different ways. And yeah. certainly it has that swirling, it's got this upward movement, but it also has a swirling movement. And what's so interesting about Pollock and Lee's work is often it's ambiguous to the point where you can actually see two opposite ideas in the same painting. You could see chaos and order. You could see violence and exuberance, that sort of thing. There's different ways of looking at it. Now, this is a small work. What do you make of this one? Anyone? Amoebas. <laughs> Looks a little like amoebas. Anybody else? Yeah, blood. Yeah. Yeah, it looks a little like blood stains, doesn't it? To me, it, it does. It looks like female anatomy out of a medical book. <laughs> yeah, it definitely, when I look at this one, it reminds me of female. Like blood, like <laughs> menstrual, like it just reminds me of female. And um, this is also a good example where someone said you have the a linear with a harder thicker line i mean a thicker paint and then you have this spreading and staining which is quite beautiful but you'll see this is a very small work this one is called water number 20. i would title it accident while cooking <laughs> okay <laughs> anyone else want to come up with an accident a, a title <laughs> um and here, this one is also uh, done in the same technique. And this one is untitled. The color is absolutely stunning. And you'll see when I walk you around, all these works together, amazing. This one is interesting. This one is different, isn't it? What do you make of this one? Looks like a cartoon. A cartoon of, of what do you mean, like a cartoon? a cartoon like it's just can something you like the mark making that reminds me of an old new yorker cartoon oh okay know. that's just my that's what i see i think it looks a little bit islamic uh -huh. what makes, makes you of a rock painting and like a cubism a what painting in cubism like a picasso a, a brock brock uh-huh yeah. And what about Mia? Mia, you had your hand up? Um, it kind of looks like those um, paintings you see in ancient civilizations, like the Aztecs, mm -hmm. for some reason. Yeah. It, it, it reminds me of that. Yeah, it looks like a fertility choice. Like a female, it looks like a female, the body female, you know, like the, like the Aztec, a fertility god. You know, they did the little uh -huh. woman, okay? Well, mm -hmm. Her mentioning that, I thought, hey, yeah. <laughs> right, so a lot of you seem to think it has this ancient kind of feeling. She calls it hieroglyphs number four. And like someone else said before, it's not literally hieroglyphs, but it might remind you of hieroglyphs, right? Lee also, um, earlier on, she did a series of little paintings where she made marks that looked a little bit like Hebrew writing but they weren't actually Hebrew letters. So you'll see this type of theme throughout her work as well. 
Now, um, I, yeah, here are some of the, if you wanna take a screenshot to look any of these works up, here are the exact titles of these works that are in the exhibition. And Portrait in Green is 55 and a quarter by 94 and a quarter inches, okay? Oil on canvas. The rest of the works that I shared with you are on paper, okay? So now let's go on our tour. So I'm in the house right now. And um, I'll just, let me step back for a moment to give you a little overview here, right? So as we walk into the house here, we have this kitchen area and some of the works are permanently on view because they were in the house when they lived here. And we also use this house as a gallery exhibition space. So way up there, we have this fish print, which is always in the house that was created by Lee's friend. And he caught a tarpon and, and printed the fish right here on this counter. And that was here, this house is all restored to when Lee died in 1984. Here we have what we were just looking at, which it's not a good view. That's why I showed you in the, uh, in the PowerPoint, this is earth number one, okay? What we'll do is let me first tour you around to show you the temporary exhibition and then I'll show you some of the other works that are always in the house. So this room right here is, this was used as you might say like an exhibition space when they lived here. So there, it's, it was relatively empty. It wasn't like a comfy, you know, living room. There's no living room couch or anything here, right? And this is where we install our temporary exhibitions, right? So here we have the water series. Uh, this is also from the Earth series. This one is Earth number seven. This one is really beautiful. Earth number five, it's a very dark, rich uh, black color with little specks of almost like an ultramarine blue or a cobalt blue. It's really beautiful. And maybe it's not actually black. It might be a dark, dark, dark brown but it's a very rich dark color. And here's the pink untitled one. So we'll look at these works on paper and then we'll look at portrait in green. This is the one that we were saying um, looks like blood and you can see it's, it's very small. It's like the size of my hand, you see that? Okay. She actually calls that one seed number three. Here's hieroglyphics. This room here um, would have been uh, more like a parlor, okay? And we have their book, their books, their bookshelf, which is really interesting to see what they were reading and what Pollock was reading and um, the music that Pollock was listening to, we have his records. And here is another very small work untitled, Let's see. This one is primarily, uh, it looks like black ink, but it's actually gouache. And here we have Lee's portrait in green, which is such a treat to have this because I'm gonna take you over to the barn studio and show you the exact spot where she made this painting, okay? Just a little close up look.
And then we have uh, Mark's photos on the wall. And um, we also have an electronic device, which is an arm, which shows them, you know, different, different stills. So you get a feeling of a movement. Now, for those of you who haven't been on the tour, I will take you and show you upstairs and show you Lee's bedroom and her studio. So this uh, was the master bedroom and now it is restored to when Lee lived here. Uh, this is one of Lee's dresses. She did like to get dressed up and go out. And this is a portrait of Lee by Igor Pontanov, her old boyfriend before Pollock. And we mentioned in the paintings uh, that they remind us of gardens and water and Lee had a love of nature. And so we see throughout the house all different natural objects that she collected shells, there's a turtle shell right here, plants, things like that. And you can see, I think, that uh, this is not fancy. This is not fancy. This house really shows the mentality, a little more of the artists and the Hamptons before, uh, when it was so different than it is today. It, at that time, it wasn't overrun with tourists and whatnot, right? So the artists really came here to enjoy nature, to commune with each other, um, to have more space. You know, this was uh, the first, the very first year Pollock painted in this small room. And then later he moved to the studio and Lee painted in here, and then she moved to the studio after his death. And we have this magnificent view. See that? This is um, way back, which I'll show you when I go outside. There's a water view of Akabana Creek, which is just incredible. And here we have the guest room. And these two twin beds, these were their marital beds. They were originally in the master bedroom. And we do have a quilt that was made by Pollock's mother, Stella, who was a really good, um, excellent craftsperson. And we have some temporary work. I mean, we have some works on the wall by Lee. They weren't necessarily hanging here when she lived here. Okay, this is by Lee, it's a lithograph. And this is by Jackson Pollock. This one is Jackson Pollock. Here we have this nice photo of Lee and Pollock in 1949. And the bathroom, uh, which they installed about a year after they moved into the house because when they moved here, there was no plumbing in the house. They uh, had to use an outhouse. The house was very run down. It was an old farmhouse. And um, it was cold. They didn't have central heat. And there were only 200 people in the entire town. It was really rural living. It was tough. Lee said it was the hardest year of her life. So what I'd like to do now is just, I'll show you some of the art that was in the house when they lived here, okay? So this is an anchor they found on the beach. You might say that's ready-made art. You find it and hang it up. And in this room, we have some small works. Oh, and 
before we get to that, I don't know if you could see, that's a photo of Lee and Pollock next to the anchor. And uh, this is box art by Ben Bianchi, Lee's assistant. And here we have a small sculpture by Lee's nephew, Ronald Stein. And this is another sculpture by Ronald Stein, which was originally a water fountain at Guildhall. It was in the backyard at Guildhall where they invited artists to make fountains. And it's made out of found objects like wood turnings and spindles and uh, chess pieces, blocks, army men. Where's the army men? Way back there, okay? So, then, so Lee purchased that from her nephew. Okay, any questions about anything? Okay. You mentioned that he had, that there was a big uh, music collection of albums. What kind of mm -hmm. music was it? What style? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Pollock uh, listened to jazz, so did Lee. But Pollock, according to Lee, Pollock drove her crazy because he listened to jazz day and night. And all of these modern artists from that era, many of the artists were influenced by jazz because what, do, what does the method of jazz have in common with the style of painting of these abstract artists? Improvisation. Improvisation within a structure, right? Yeah. Yep. And also it becomes more abstract when you're listening to the sound for the sound's sake, right? Right. So Pollock didn't listen to music when he painted, but he was definitely influenced by jazz. You can go to pkhouse.org and there's a nice little short video on there mm. that um, just gives you a little overview of his relationship to jazz. The type of jazz that Pollock listened to was popular jazz like Louis Armstrong. But the video, it's more avant-garde jazz, but that wasn't really what pa Pollock was listening to. But anyway, so this is the spectacular property purchased in 1946 with a loan from Peggy Guggenheim, Pollock's art patron. And Akabana Creek way back there in the distance, that water just continues, that would go all the way out to Montauk. All the land in the distance, like way, way in the back, that's a nature preserve. It's a marshy area. And the barn, which I'm about to show you, was originally situated way back there on a concrete uh, base. And Pollock and his friends moved it so as to not block this spectacular view. And here is the house behind us. So let's go into the barn. And I love this. We get to see exactly where Lee made her portrait in green. And here's the outhouse. And here's the barn. Lee arranged that this would become a museum under the auspices of Stony Brook University before she died. Her entire estate and the estate of Pollock um, is the sales of the paintings um, are contributed to the Pollock Krasna Foundation. It's a separate organization from the museum and it gives grants artists and f.org to find out how to apply for a grant if you're a professional artist okay so now i'm in the barn and i am going to put on these little booties so we can go into the studio here okay so bear with me while i'm doing this any questions like to visit the Paula Krasna House and Study Center, go to pkhouse.org and sign up for one of our guided tours. Okay, we don't have drop-ins. So uh, I would suggest that you sign up now for an advanced plan we get sold out. 
okay, pkhouse.org. And you can also find our other virtual programs on there as well. Okay, they're all, all the virtual programs are free, all right? So this is the first part of the studio that's uh, used for storage, right? And here we have Lee Krasner's painting cart and her shoes and her stool. We have Lee Krasner's supplies, her powdered pigments, way up high, her mosaic glass pieces. Lee made a beautiful mosaic glass table and it's round, you can see that online. And um, she also made a mosaic mural in New York City, which is it's spectacular, but it's not small mosaic pieces, it's large shapes. Here we have Lee's apron or smock right here. So it's a very intimate view, isn't it? Now, Pollock, as I said, died in 1956, drinking and driving. He took the life of Edith Metzger, the passenger with him, and Ruth Kligman survived. This floor is, is Pollock's accidental drips, right? He laid the canvas on the floor, and by accident, the paint dripped onto the floor. This is not a painting. Now, a year after Pollock's death, Lee came in here to paint and used this as her studio till the end of her life. This photo was taken by, in 1962 by Hans Name. And you can see all of her paintings behind her on the wall. She did not paint on the floor like Pollock. And what's interesting is when you walk around the studio, you can see it's called the ghost marks. You see them? where you could see her rectangles. Do you see where they were? So right here, we see different colors, right? That would form the edge of a rectangle where the paint went onto the wall. And here, what do we see? Right over here, for example, that very rich green that Lee was using for portrait in green. So it's right here where Lee made portrait in green. See that? So what is the importance of coming into an artist's studio? What can we learn from a visit to an artist's studio that you might not get if you saw the work solely in a museum? Anyone? A sense of their process, I suppose. The history of what she did and how she went about her art. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You really get a sense of the process, the trial and error, the experimentation, the spontaneity, right? Um, when you're in a museum, the work is, it's so pristine. It's almost like a temple, right? Uh, you see the final result. You really don't get it as much of a sense of the process. And you get to see also in context, Lee's love of nature. You can imagine it's so spectacularly beautiful here, right? So it's easy to imagine how she would have been inspired by all the beauty around her, right? The water, the, the trees, the open space, et cetera. Now, there's a unique feature in this barn. This is Pollock's floor, untouched by Lee. Now, how does that work if he died in 1956? Well, while they were both alive, they winterized the studio. So you could see here, the floor is actually covered, you see? And after Lee died, years later when it, it was becoming a museum in 1987, the conservatives came in here and they took the white boards off, peeled off the black paper, to reveal Pollock's floor underneath. And that's why this floor is solely Jackson Pollock's and it was untouched by Lee. So here we have Lee and Pollock, 1945. Um, Lee and Pollock met originally at a dance, but Lee doesn't usually say that's where they met. 
because um, she usually cites their meeting as that they were in a gallery exhibition at Macmillan Gallery, and she had never heard of Pollock. So she found out his address and uninvited went to his studio apartment, studio slash apartment in New York City. They moved out here in 1945, purchased the property a year later. Uh, Lee negotiated that um, with Peggy Guggenheim that Pollock would have a stipend, a monthly stipend, so he didn't have to work at a job. Pollock would be the breadwinner. They didn't have children. They had two dogs, Gypsy and Ahab. Lee knew early on Pollock had a drinking problem and she figured she could, you know, handle that. We have another talk on my YouTube channel called Pollock Alcoholism and Art, where I go into detail about Pollock's alcoholism and the impact of his art. So you can go to Joyce Raimondo YouTube if you wanna see any of those past talks. Here's Pollock with his pet crow, Caw Caw. Now they were doing quite well, Pollock uh, rose to fame and they were actually financially living above the average um, median household in the US. They had everything that the American dream would, you know, involve a car, a land, house. Pollock rose from poverty. Lee was brought up um, in Brooklyn. Her parents owned a store. And I'll get into that a little more on, on Thursday. But um, anyway, Jackson Pollock, this is Life Magazine. He rises to fame. Everything's going well. And Pollock did, was sober when he made his great drip paintings. He succumbed to alcoholism and he had a relapse and um, he became severely depressed. Lee went to Paris. Pollock also started a marital affair with Ruth Kligman. His work declined as a result of his alcoholism. And um, sadly, he died in 1956 while Lee was in Paris. We have in the barn studio Pollock's original house paints. He didn't use art paint to do the drip paintings. He used house paint, squirting paint from basters, dripping paint from sticks, using non-art materials. I have a question right. about Lee. The woman um, and then the man, yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a question about Lee. Did she, um, did she, was she painting before she met Pollock or did, or? Yes, um, absolutely. Yes, no, 100% Pollock. Uh, I mean, Lee was an artist early on in her life. She went to Cooper Union in New York City. She also attended for a short time the Art Students League. Lee starts off painting representationally, um, a portrait you could see somewhat realistic portraits of herself in nature, things like that. Similar to Pollock, gradually she becomes more and more abstract. People often, but she was very involved in the arts. She worked for the WPA, which was the mural um, project um, where art, the government paid artists full time. And she was very active in the New York City art world. She continued painting while Pollock was alive, but she didn't focus on promoting her career while he was alive. She managed his career and um, she was very good at negotiating to get him the stipend, to get them the down payment, giving him tips on sometimes, you know, how to be interviewed, things like that. And so Lee is often noted as being very important not only as an artist, but also in the um, 
forming of this group of this type of art, the success of abstract expressionism. Because as Pollock rose to fame, all the other artists painting in this way where you're expressing yourself through a very physical act of painting, all of the other artists rise to fame. All of the other prices go up. All of the artists associated with that kind of painting. Does that make sense? So Lee is important in both regards as an artist, as well as a promoter of abstract expressionism. She was a brilliant, brilliant woman. And yes, was a serious artist right early on. Thank you Thank so you, much. Joy. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my oh, pleasure. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Wonderful. You. And Thank you, you can go much. also, you I'll put this to YouTube. Just Google YouTube Joyce Raimondo, and you can see some of the past talks in there. We don't post all of them. We post some of the guest speakers and some of the special topics. Okay. But we have, at this point, I have like 70 videos on this. So Thank, Thank you. you so much, Joyce. Thank I really so enjoyed it.